Hey Optomancers, Chris here. At some point or another, I've raided pretty much every spell in the game. I think there's a few exceptions. I use a color-coded rating system, and as viewers of this channel know, if I rate a spell as red, then I think it's a bad spell. Then again, there are bad spells, and then there's terrible spells. Today I'm going to talk about 10 spells where red rating was too generous. These spells are beastly, repulsive, rotten, vile, horrid, disastrous, awful, and appalling in the game. If you would like to support the content on this channel, please consider supporting me through Patreon. Patrons receive ad-free early releases of these videos, and I get together with my top-level patrons for some D&D regularly. Today I would like to recognize Christian Windham, CJ Johnstad, Condor, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David F., Dewey Cheatham and Howe, Don and Douglas Reynolds, thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. So I'm limiting this list to spells that a player who doesn't know the game well might actually take unknowingly which means I'm excluding Dream of the Blue Veil from this list, as I think even an inexperienced player is going to recognize the spell has no use without a DM on board with it. So now I present the 10 worst spells in D&D. Number 10, Searing Smite. Now, Paladin Smite spells generally aren't very good, but Searing Smite is the worst of the lot. So remember that this spell requires your bonus action to cast and it is going to require your concentration throughout the duration of this spell. The next time you hit with a melee weapon attack, so it's one of those smite spells that doesn't work with ranged weapons, you deal an additional 1d6 fire damage. Now often these spells will do like d6s instead of d8s, but this one is doing less dice and a lower die type. And then the damage is fire damage, which in terms of reliability is so-so. Certainly far less than the radiance that you would do with just a plain smite. And at that point, you have to continue your concentration for sure. Because you have to wait at least until the target's next turn. At which point, they get to make a constitution saving throw at the start of their turn. And if they fail that save, they take a d6 damage. And if they succeed on the save, the spell ends. And if the creature uses an action, they can get rid of the effect automatically. So the problems here are just a multitude. We're using concentration. We're doing really, really terrible damage. The opponent can end it rather easily. It's targeting the worst possible saving throw. And there is a really, really good chance that you're going to use your concentration and a first level spell to do 1d6 fire damage. There is no way you can't find a better first level spell to concentrate on. In fact, you're going to have a hard time finding a first level spell that is worse to concentrate on than Searing Smite. I mean, you just would have been so much better to just throw a smite on that attack. And I'm not even a big fan of smites, but this is just terrible. Number 9, Frost Fingers. So, do you remember when I rated Burning Hands as red? Well. I owe Burning Hands an apology, because apparently the designers thought that Burning Hands was too powerful, because they made just a worse version of it with the spell Frost Fingers. So this is a first level spell that creates a 15 foot cone. Now I've talked about the problems with cone spells before, but they are hard to place. And we're really talking about six squares, but you're not going to get six creatures in it almost never. At best, you're probably going to get one or two. And the damage here is 2d8. Burning Hands does 3d6. So this is going to do about two less points of damage on average. And we're going to give them a constitution saving throw instead of the dexterity saving throw that Burning Hands gave them. So we took the Burning Hands spell and we reduced the damage and we gave the opponent a better saving throw. Now before anyone tells me that this spell scales better than Burning Hands. Make sure that you include your address when you do that so that I can come and slap you. Do not be upcasting Frost Fingers. Do not be upcasting Burning Hands. 
Number eight, Immolation. This one is a fifth level spell. Now, immediately, if you think of spells that put things on fire, you're probably thinking about Fireball. That's a third level spell that does 8d6 damage to a multitude of enemies. Now, how many enemies does Immolation hit? One. How much damage does it do? 8d6. And you might be thinking, well, why would it do 8d6 when Fireball can do 8d6 to multiple people? And I would say, well, because Immolation is a fifth level spell. And then you might say, yeah, but fifth level's higher level than third level. Shouldn't it be better? And I would say, yeah, but there's another advantage here. We're going to take your concentration as well. And then you might say, so let me get this straight. It's a fifth level spell. It only hits one creature, same damage as a fireball, same saving throw as a fireball, and it's going to use my concentration. So isn't it worse in almost every respect to a fireball? And I would say, don't you confuse me with your logic. Now I will say, if they fail their save, they get to burn for the spell's duration. And that's up to a minute. And so you get to keep concentrating on this spell. And if the opponent fails their saving throw, you get to do 46 damage to them, and they shed some light. Now the light actually could potentially be good if we were in maybe some kind of magical darkness, because this would technically be a spell that generates light that would be a higher level than darkness spells, except you can't even cast Immolation on a creature you can't see. So if the darkness is preventing you from seeing, then you can't cast Immolation to create the light in the darkness in the first place, so the light is pretty much useless. This is just a spell for a ninth or higher level character that is going to steal your concentration round after round for a chance to do maybe 46 fire damage to one opponent. This spell is insultingly bad. That brings us to the seventh worst spell, Power Word Pain. Seventh worst spell, and it's a seventh level spell. So spells of this level should be overwhelmingly powerful. We have to be a 13th level sorcerer, warlock, or wizard to get access to this spell. And before somebody tells me that maybe a bard could take it with magical secrets, don't you do it. Don't stop it. Power Word Pain is awful. First of all, if you're 13th level or higher, you probably have opponents with more than 100 hit points, which means that this spell doesn't work on any of them. Now, if you beat down your opponents, they will eventually have less than 100 hit points. But assuming you don't know how many hit points your enemies have, you don't know when that is. You don't know the point when your opponent is under 100 hit points. If they're near death, then you probably shouldn't be spending 7th level spells on them in the first place. So this already is a terrible spell. But we can make it worse. We really can. Number one, let's make creatures immune to it if they're immune to charm. Now, a number of our lower level spells are actually really, really good against creatures, and they don't have a 100 hit point limit, but one of their weaknesses, spells like Hypnotic Pattern, for example, is that if a creature is immune to Charm, then they're immune to Hypnotic Pattern. So we need some spells that can work against those creatures because one thing i found is as you get into higher levels, immunity to Charm becomes more and more common. So here we've got a high level spell, targets one target, we have to guess hit points, probably not going to work on any significant target early in the battle. We're going to have to work them down till they're almost dead, and we could have just killed them, but instead we're going to spend a 7th level slot. So we do so, and then we have to deal with the fact that if they're immune to charm, this still doesn't work. And if we get through all these things, and we actually manage to lock this on a creature that is already close to death and wasn't immune to charm in the first place, then we slow it down, you know, kind of thing you can do with a first level character. We give it some disadvantage on some checks, and it's going to make concentration saves to cast spells. And this is an okay debuff, but it's pretty weak for 7th level, even if it didn't have all these requirements to make it work in the first place. And after the very first turn that it suffers these effects, it gets a constitution saving throw that does not have disadvantage, and it ends the effect on a success. So, high level, have to guess hit points, creature needs to be almost dead already, can't be immune to charm, and all those things, all of them in place, and still 
the effect is relatively minor for a 7th level spell and is probably going to last for one round. Power word pain, absolutely horrible. Number six, prismatic spray. So we're still in our 7th level spells, meaning we have to be a high level caster to even access this spell. We're probably only going to be able to cast it once a day and maybe that's for the best. So this is a cone spell, which right away means it's harder to place than other spells. It's harder to avoid friendly fire. It has to originate from you. And every creature that gets caught in the cone needs to make a dexterity saving throw. And then a random effect is going to occur. So you roll the d8 and on a one, you're going to do less damage than an upcast fireball fire damage. On a two, you're going to do less damage than a upcast fireball acid damage. Number three, you're going to do less damage than an upcast fireball lightning damage. Number four, you're going to do less damage than an upcast fireball poison damage. Oh. Number five, you're going to do less damage than an upcast fireball cold damage. Number six, you're going to restrain a target. You know you can restrain targets, by the way, with first level spells. Now it could become petrified, but to do so, it has to fail its constitution saving throw three times. Three failed constitution saving throws before that happens. And it's one saving throw per round. And if they get three successful saving throws, the condition ends. So they have to actually fail three before they succeed on three, which means you might be dealing with just the restraining condition for six rounds. So six rounds to cast a freedom of movement spell or to spell magic or whatever. And during that time, it's restrained, something we would expect from a first level spell. Then if we roll a seven, the target is blinded. And again, only blinded if they failed their initial saving throw. And blinded, by the way, something we can do with a second level spell. And a spell that turns you blind is a second level spell. They get a saving throw at the start of your next turn. If they make it, condition ends. But this one does have the one effect that is actually decent. And that is, if it fails the second saving throw, it's transported to another plane of existence and it's no longer blinded. But of course, if you transport a creature to another plane of existence, you've probably defeated it. But in order to get that effect, let's just be clear, you have to, number one, have them fail their initial saving throw, their dexterity saving throw. Number two, you must roll a seven on the d8. And then number three, it has to fail its wisdom saving throw on the following turn. So in other words, don't expect this effect to ever happen. And then if you roll an eight, the creature is struck by two rays, which means that you might actually do more damage than an upcast fireball against that one target. So there are so many things that are terrible about this spell. For one, assuming that by 13th level and higher, we're facing creatures that have some resistances or immunities, this is a terrible spell because you have a chance of hitting those immunities. Just the fact that if we roll a four, it's poison damage, counts out all kinds of creatures that might be immune to the spell depending on the roll of the d8. And none of the damage types are damage types that we don't see resistance or immunities for. Fire, acid, lightning, poison, and cold. And then we have a restrained effect, which is really pathetic for this level. A blind effect, which is really pathetic for this level. But maybe we can do two of them. But the fact that they're unpredictable means there's hardly any creatures we can cast this at and be even moderately confident that anything is going to happen to them. Number five, legend lore. Now I am not against divination spells. I find divination spells can be very effective, but legend lore is a really, really terrible one. It is fifth level, means you cannot even access this spell unless you're a ninth level bard, cleric, or wizard, or the undying pact. This is a 10 minute cast, so this is something you have to do out of combat. And it is not a ritual, and a lot of these kinds of spells are rituals, but not legend lore, you get to use your fifth level spell slot. Now the way legend lore works is the very first thing you have to do is give up 250 gold pieces worth of spell components. And they are consumed during the spell casting. So we're using spell slots, high level ones, and we're using components that we lose. 
We're also using a 10 minute casting time. This better give us a ton of information. And this is how much information you get. You describe a person, place, or object. And if the thing you named isn't of legendary importance, you gain no information. But if it does have legendary importance, then you will get some information. And that might be current tales, forgotten stories, or secret lore that has never been widely known. But according to the spell text, it might be couched in figurative language. For example, and this is the example in the spell, you have a mysterious magic axe on hand. The spell might yield this information. Woe to the evildoer whose hand touches the axe, for even the half slices the hand of evil ones. Only a true child of stone, lover and beloved of Moradin, may awaken the true powers of the axe, and only with a sacred word Rednog on the lips. And so what you end up with is this spell, and first off, unless you find a legendary item or, or going to a legendary location you need information about, then you get no information and this is useless and you've wasted your spell. You found a magic axe and maybe it's legendary, then you cast a spell and almost certainly you will waste it and get no information because most items that you find are not legendary. And if the item is legendary, don't you already know a fair bit about this item? How much more information do you really need? And if you do need that information, shouldn't you at least get it in plain language? rather than some kind of cryptic message. So we have a high level divination spell, takes a long time to cast, it's going to use a high level spell slot, you can't cast it as a ritual, and there's a good chance it won't work. It's only going to work on a very small amount of people, places, or objects, and when it does, it's going to give you information that you probably didn't need, and it might be in cryptic language that you might not understand or might be misleading. Yeah, great spell. Number four, Mordenkainen's Sword. I recently did a one-shot where I had an Archmage cast this on the party just to try to draw out a counterspell. And whenever that counterspell failed and the Mordenkainen's Sword appeared, it was good for a laugh. So we are back in seventh level spells. Again, these spells, in theory, it should be powerful, but there seem to be a lot of them that are terrible. And Mordenkainen and Sword actually makes Prismatic Spray look like a pretty good spell. So you're going to cast a spell, it's going to use your action, and it's going to last for one minute using your concentration. So when you use your concentration and you are a 13th level Bard or Wizard, you'd expect to be getting a reasonably good effect. Well, in this case, you can make an attack roll using your bonus action and your concentration and if you hit, you know what you do? 3d10 damage. That means, on average, on a hit, this is going to do about 17 points of damage per round using your concentration at 13th level and higher. At this kind of level, wizards and bards should be able to absolutely turn around reality to their will using their concentration. Or, poke them with this sword for some crappy damage. This one is comically bad. Number three, find traps. Now, I assume anyone who regularly watches this channel knew find traps is going to be here. Find traps is uh, the most misleading spell in the game. In fact, this spell is what we call a trap. In other words, some option for a player that is misleading and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. In this case, the Find Trap spell does not find traps. To quote this spell, This spell merely reveals that a trap is present. You don't learn the location of each trap. You just learn the general nature of the danger posed by a trap you sense. Now, note to the designers, the word find indicates that you are finding something. If somebody claimed they were psychic and they could sense the location of ghosts and then you took them to a house and they said, I sense there is a ghost somewhere in this house. Then they said, there you go. I found you a ghost. No, you didn't. You haven't found something. You just claim to sense something is nearby. Find traps is like that. There's a trap somewhere. Well, if you suspected there was a trap somewhere enough that you figured you were going to cast a spell to find it, then you probably already knew there was a trap somewhere, or at least there was a good chance there was. 
And what you needed was a way to find that trap. So you thought maybe the find trap spell might work. Sorry, doesn't do that. And I should mention that in a lot of dungeons, there are traps, and I mean literally marked as traps, where you have something like an unstable floor or other natural hazard, but find traps doesn't work on those at all. It has to be a manufactured trap. So it has to be a certain kind of trap, and you don't find it. That's the find trap spell. Sucks. Now that brings us to number two, weird. This is a ninth level spell. It's the only ninth level spell on this list. Now there are a number of ninth level spells that I think in general are bad choices for player characters, but there are usually some kind of strange circumstance where they might actually be a good option. Something like Storm of Vengeance, which is a bad spell for a ninth level spell, but it has such a massive, massive area that maybe there might be some situation where that could be useful. But weird is just a bad spell for ninth level. And I mean really, really bad, insultingly bad. Because this doesn't have a massive, massive area. I mean, 30 foot radius sphere is still a big sphere, it's bigger than a fireball, but for ninth level spells, this is nothing. We're not talking about massive scale here, we're still talking about the scale that we normally have in combats for player characters. And then everybody in that sphere, when you cast it, first you got to use your concentration, of course you do. Why would we have a crappy spell that doesn't also take your concentration? So every creature in the area is going to make a wisdom saving throw. If they make it, nothing happens. Second, if they're immune to the frightened condition, nothing happens. When you're 17th level and higher, being immune to frightened is pretty common for a lot of creatures you're going to be fighting. So let's say the creatures actually fail, and let's say the creatures are not immune to frightened. Okay, so now they're frightened. What happens now? Well, for the next turn, they're frightened. So they have disadvantage on attack rolls. And there's some limit to their movement capability. Then, at the end of their turn, they make a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail, they take 4d10 psychic damage. So 18 points on average of psychic damage. But if they succeed on the save, the spell's over. So just to be clear, in order for this spell to do more than one round of Frightened, we have to have a creature fail two saving throws. And they also must fail both of those saving throws in a row in order to take any damage from this at all. And I've mentioned this before, but if you want to do a good fear effect, take the third level spell, Fear. It's better than Weird. Weird gives a saving throw every turn. Fear does not. So what we have here is a ninth level spell that can be fairly directly linked to a third level spell. So you did those additional 12 levels in order to get a spell that was worse than a spell you could already cast. Before we get to number one, I've got some dishonorable mentions. First one, Enervation. Red was too good a rating for this spell. Fifth level spell, so it is high level. Uses your concentration. Targets only one creature. If they make their save, they take almost no damage, and the spell ends. If they fail their save, they take still really, really crappy damage. And then you get to keep concentrating on it. And as an action on every turn, and you continue concentrating, you can do this continual crappy damage to one target. Though, if the creature doesn't want to take that damage, that's easy enough, because all they have to do is move out of your range, and the spell immediately ends. Or they could go behind cover, and that works too. Now, I should say that whatever damage you deal to the target, you regain hit points equal to half that amount. But maybe you heard me say this before, the damage here is crappy. And so half that damage is even crappier. Second dishonorable mention, Dust Devil. So Dust Devil is a concentration spell of second level that is likely use up your action and do nothing. Because when you cast a Dust Devil, it does nothing. You get this elemental force that resembles a Dust Devil, appears in a cube, and has no effect whatsoever. And in order to have any effect, a creature has to end its turn within five feet of the Dust Devil. Now, why is a creature going to choose to end its turn within five feet of a dust devil? No reason. They just can go elsewhere. 
and the spell does nothing and you wasted your concentration and your action. But maybe you could force them or restrain them or use some other kind of resource to make sure they're near the dust devil. Then what happens? Well, they take a D8 of damage and they're pushed 10 feet. And that's only on a failed save. On a successful save, they take half the damage and they're not moved. So less than you would get with a first level thunder wave that they can't avoid and doesn't use your concentration. And by the way, once they're pushed 10 feet, they're not in range of the Dust Devil anymore, so they take no more effect from it. Terrible spell. Red was too good for this one. And our final dishonorable mention, Investiture of Wind. Did you ever take the Fly spell and then decide, I wish I could cast this with a 6th level slot? Well, I've got the spell for you. Because the primary thing of this spell is exactly the Fly spell. And what do we get for additional 3 levels? Well, range attacks have disadvantage. And you have an ability you can use with your action that is terrible and you should never use your action on. I mean, arguably worse than a cantrip. So why wouldn't we just take fly and upcast it to 6th level and then we could have 4 members of the party flying. Or we could cast this spell and have one person fly and not much else. And unlike fly, it's limited to self. But... As bad as this is, as bad as all the others are, there's one spell that's worse than them all, and whatever rating I would give worse than red for the rest of these spells, this one would require yet another rating below that. Number one, True Strike. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. True Strike is a cantrip that basically does nothing. You have to use your concentration, you have to use an action, and on your next turn, you get advantage on one attack. And that attack needs to be your first attack. Now, if you're a caster, maybe you have Find Familiar giving you the help action, then you can do this anytime you want without using your action or concentration by having your Familiar deliver the help action. But just to point out how useless this is, I mean, you are giving up your attacks this round so you can have advantage on your attacks next round. So just to be clear, that means that if you would have, say, attacked twice, you would normally roll a d20 for each attack, so you would have a chance to miss twice if both d20s missed, or hit twice if both d20s hit, or hit once if one of those d20s was a hit and one was a miss. But with True Strike, we just make that worse. Because now, if both d20s miss, we still miss, and if one of those d20s hits, we hit, but only once, and only on the second turn. And if both of these d20s hit, we still only hit once. Now, every time I read this spell, I think maybe there could be some kind of, like, really important attack roll you're making. This attack roll that you just can't have miss. But I keep thinking what that would be. Because, I mean, there's certainly big things that casters can do. But they generally do not require attack rolls, so True Strike generally isn't going to do you any good. Then I think, you know, what if it's a rogue, and they're, like, sneaking to attack an enemy, and then they're going to have that one big attack, and they want to have advantage on it, and they want to be able to inflict their sneak attack, maybe then. And nope, that doesn't work either, because if they're sneaking, they're already going to have advantage on their first attack. There's just no big attack that... I can think of that makes it worth taking a cantrip and spending an action and your concentration in order to set up. So this ends up being this cantrip I just can't think of any use for. And in every case you use it, it's going to end up being bad. And here's the thing, I think that True Strike, unlike something like, say, Weird, is more likely to be a trap for a new player. Because if you're playing 17th level, you're probably not a new player. You probably have at least some instincts on how the game works. But cantrips are something new players use. So I think a new player has a far bigger chance of falling into the trap of True Strike than any other spell on this list. And we are talking about a cantrip that not only does nothing, but is worse than nothing. So those are the worst 10 spells in the game and a few dishonorable mentions. Now I ranked all these spells as red already, but red was too good for them. In my next video, I'm going to be going over 10 more red spells. But these are red spells that are probably a little bit better than the red makes them appear. So I hope you'll join me for that. 
And until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon.